the fact that there's no discussion afterwards means that I can be as provocative as I like. And um, uh, I, I think I am going to be fairly provocative in some ways. But first of all, can I just say, pr probably on behalf of all of us, as this is the last session, um, I'm sure we all agree a huge thank you for task for organizing what has been an absolutely brilliant and topical uh, uh, debate and conference. Uh, and of course, um, thank you very much for the hospitality and, and, and looking after us uh, so well. Um, I, um, I want to really co concentrate on one issue, uh, which I've called the distribution question. Um, uh, what I mean by that, uh, well, I really want to look at two issues um, the first is, can we say anything about the extent to which the change in the distribution, that's the way the cake is divided, uh, was itself a cause of the 2008 crash and the crisis we're in? And the second question is, uh, can we say anything about the extent to which uh, the distribution is also inhibiting uh, recovery? Um, well, the first thing to say on this subject, of course, is that inequality has been rising uh, dramatically up uh, the political agenda. It simply wasn't on the agenda before 2007-2008. Uh, Indeed, this question of the relationship between inequality and instability has become, in almost less than a year, one of the hottest topics in macroeconomics. Uh, um, in January this year, uh, during his State of the Union address, President Obama uh, defined inequality, it said inequality was the defining issue of our time. Um, at the Davos meeting in February, um, delegates were asked, uh, defined inequality as one of the globe's two most pressing problems. Uh, the other was fiscal imbalances. Um, in a very telling Washington Post a poll published uh, just a few months ago, uh, people were asked which was the greatest worry? Uh, unfairness in the way economies favors the wealthy or overregulation of free markets that interferes with growth and prosperity. And remarkably, they chose the first unfairness by a margin of 52 to 39%. Now, I think we'd all agree that's quite a remarkable result for a country that's always favored uh, a wealthy elite. Um, so, um, of course, even talking about the relationship between inequality uh, and instability is a huge heresy to those who hold the current economic orthodoxy. Now, that economic orthodoxy still maintains almost a complete grip on policy makers, on economic schools, on business schools. Um, that economic orthodoxy holds that inequality or a high level of inequality is a necessary condition for economic success. It's an idea that emerged out of the new right thinking uh, immediately after the war, but remained very much on the sidelines through the, night, the egalitarian era of the 1950s and 1960s and then became much more widely accepted during the crisis uh, of the 1970s, when it came to be argued that egalitarianism had gone too far and that what economies needed was a stiff dose of inequality if we were to recover from the slump of the time. It was an idea that uh, also filtered into more mainstream economists. Um, and one of the most influential books of the time that took up this idea was a book by the American economist Arthur Okun, who wrote a book called Equality and Efficiency, The Great Trade-Off. And what Okun basically argued was that you can have efficiency or you can have equality, but you can't have both. You've got to take a choice between uh, one or the other. Um, now, this was an idea that may have initiated originally with the right, but it came to be accepted across the political spectrum uh, eventually by the Democratic Party in the United States, and, of course, uh, by uh, New Labour in the United Kingdom. Um, and this idea, or this theory, for theory it was, was then effectively put into practice um, in what could be called a real-life economic experiment, a sort of dramatic leap in the dark from the early 1980s, uh, beginning in the United States 
uh, and the United Kingdom, uh, but eventually spreading uh, to most uh, rich nations. Um, and so what we had was a move from the great, what was, came to be known as the great leveling of the 1950s and 1960s, when there was a steady reduction in inequality, um, to um, the great widening, when the gap has uh, returned to the levels uh, pretty well of the uh, 1930s. And of course, it's not just the UK and the US where this has happened. Um, it's happening elsewhere as well. And, and, and one of the fastest growing levels of inequality since 2000 has actually been in Germany. Um, now, the most important driver of increasing inequality is what's been happening to wages. Um, in both the United States and the, U and the United Kingdom, there have been two simultaneous trends. First, a fall in the share of output going to wages, and secondly, a big increase in the dispersion of wages within that wage pool. Um, if we look at the United Kingdom, the wage share rose uh, after the war, uh, compared with the previous 100 years, and rose to an average of about 59 to 60 percent, uh, and it stayed pretty static at that level between uh, the late 1940s and the late uh, 1960s. It then rose quite sharply during the crisis of the 1970s to reach 64 percent, and then it's been in free fall ever since, and it now stands at around 53 percent. So we've had this steady, dramatic fall in the share of output uh, going to wages. Uh, and the bulk of that fall in the wage share has been borne by the bottom two-thirds. The, the, the low-income and middle-income groups have borne uh, the greatest share of that. So effectively what's happening is that the bottom two-thirds of the population, not just in the United Kingdom but in most countries, have been experiencing uh, a declining fall of a diminishing uh, relative pool. Um, and one of the big effects of this has been in a dramatic increase in low pay. Um, if you look at uh, a chart of uh, low pay by countries, by which I mean the proportion of the working population uh, receiving low pay, which is defined as 60% of the median, then the uh, five countries that stand at the top are the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, Canada, Germany, and Ireland. Um, Britain, the proportion of workers on low pay in the United Kingdom has doubled in the last uh, 25 years. Um, and of course, the big winners from this, uh, these, the losers have been the bulk of the workforce, the big winners from this, as we know, have been uh, this very small elite, financial and business elite, um, who have enjoyed dramatic increases in the share of income in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and in a number of uh, other countries as well. Now, According to this theory and this experiment, um, the raising the level of inequality, boosting corporate profits, increasing rewards at the top uh, would have a very big economic payback. The level of investment, it would increase incentives, it would lead to more dynamic economies, and it would lead to a bigger cake, so everybody would eventually be better off. Um, uh, well, uh, this was the theory, and of course, as we know, um, uh, this 30-year-long experiment has, in fact, uh, not worked according to the theory. On almost every measure of economic success, with the possible exception of inflation, uh, economies have had a much worse record. Most economies have had a worse record. I'm talking about the rich world here, by the way. Um, uh, in the post-1980 inegalitarian period, than in the pre-1980 egalitarian period. So if we take the United Kingdom, uh, the level of growth since 1980 on average have been about two-thirds of the post-war decades. Uh, the uh, level of productivity has also been about two-thirds. Uh, unemployment has been running at about three times uh, the level of the 1950s and 1960s. And perhaps most significant of all, economies have become much more unstable and turbulent. Uh, so we had three, in the United Kingdom and globally, we had three very mild uh, recessions in the post-war era. Uh, since 1980, uh, the recessions have got deeper and longer. Um, so why has this theory failed to work? Well, the reason it's failed to work is because the distribution question is absolutely critical to the way the cake is divided is absolutely critical 
uh, to uh, the way um, economies work. Um, and indeed, the distribution question has long been a central issue of political economy. Uh, in the 19th century, the founding fathers, and they were all fathers um, of modern economics, from David Ricardo uh, through to Alfred Marshall, and of course it was Alfred Marshall who first coined the phrase poverty amidst, amidst plenty, uh, were very preoccupied with this question of how the cake should be distributed, and they spent a long time discussing why so little of the cake ended up in the hands of the bulk of the uh, workforce. It became a recurring theme um, be, uh, through and beyond the 19th century when only was only really resolved in the post-war era. Um, and um, uh, when, of course, we had, as, as I've been talking about, the, the, the great leveling. Um, unfortunately, this resolution was, uh, in historical terms, to prove uh, very short-lived. Um, indeed, um, since 1980, uh, during the period of, 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 of the Great Widening, the distribution question came to be, amongst the bulk of economists, came to be viewed very differently indeed. It came to be viewed much more negatively and, high, as, and, and as highly dangerous. Um, if I can quote the uh, Chicago economist and Nobel uh, laureate, uh, Robert Lucas, um, who is one of, if not the uh, leading architect of the pro-market, self-regulating economic school uh, that has dominated Anglo-Saxon economic uh, policy um, over most of the last 30 years. This is what he said in 2003. Of the tendencies that are harmful to sound economics, the most poisonous is to focus on the question of distribution. Uh, now, Lucas, of course, is not a man uh, to have minced his words. In the same year when he was giving the presidential address to the American uh, Economic Association, he said, um, the central problem of depression economics has been solved for all practical purposes. Um, it was a view, I mean, one can, you know, take on Robert Lucas and say, well, you got it badly wrong, but it was a view that was, uh, of course, very widely, widely accepted at the time, you know, that we thought we'd found a new paradigm, economic miracle, we had this prolonged boom from the sort of mid-1990s, unemployment was falling, and everybody's saying, God, we, we've solved the economic problem. And of course, very many fewer economists would sign up uh, to that idea uh, today. Um, uh, so, and, and indeed, um, following the, the crisis, we are um, very much back to the same debate that was taking place 150 years ago. Uh, so what can we say, going back to this first question, what can we say about the role that distribution played uh, in the way econ economies function and in the 2008 crisis? Um, well, I think the evidence is that above a certain limit, of the concentration of income, uh, then economies start to dysfunction. They start to lose the processes that ensure a degree of steady equilibrium. Uh, indeed, a model of capitalism that skews the proceeds of growth too unevenly in either direction increases the risk of self-destruction. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because of the relationship between two key variables. Uh, those variables are uh, the rate of wage growth and the rate of productivity growth. And if either of these variables get seriously out of line in either direction, then they have serious consequences from the economy. And we can look, if we look back over the last uh, 100 years, there have been three different relationships between wage growth and productivity growth. First of all, in the post-war era, uh, the 20 years from 1950, wages increased more or less in line with productivity, increases in growth were relatively evenly shared, and that, of course, was a period of historic uh, stability. Um, then in the early 1970s, we have this significant jump in wages compared with productivity. Wages were outstripping productivity, and this became known amongst economists, including left-wing economists, as the, as the era of the profit squeeze. And as we know, that did contribute um, to, 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 to some of the economic problems of, of the 1970s. And then 
during the 1920s and uh, since, two th since uh, the, the early 1980s, uh, we've had a, 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 a period, a very sustained period, and wages have fallen increasingly behind productivity, and both of these have ended in very deep-seated recessions. Now, why is that? Why is it that when wages fall behind productivity uh, over long, sustained periods of time, that we end up with crises? Well, there are three basic reasons. The first reason uh, uh, is to do with demand. Um, others have referred to this, and Terence was, was referring it to, to, in the previous talk. Um, if wages fall behind uh, the rate of economic growth, then purchasing power falls behind uh, uh, the extra output being produced. So consumer societies effectively lose their capacity to consume, and economies would simply grind to a halt very quickly. It, to prevent economies gri grinding to a halt, you need some kind of major prop. Uh, and, of course, the major prop uh, that has been used um, uh, was used from the sort of mid, the late 1980s onwards was to pump economies full of, uh, full of debt. And we had this massive e explosion in, in debt. Uh, and, of course, that is completely uh, uh, unsustainable. Uh, it doesn't prevent recession. It simply delays it. The second reason is um, that when you... Um, switch the distribution of the cake away from wage earners to the sort of top small financial elite, uh, then you effectively end up creating asset bubbles. And this is because, uh, essentially, these big private surpluses of, of the last sort of 15 years have not been spent in the way that neoclassical economics said they should be spent by boosting investment um, and encouraging entrepreneurialism. Uh, what they've been done is, is chasing uh, the highest return. So you've had this tsunami of money chasing around the world, not being invested in productive economy, uh, but being invested in, in assets, particularly property and businesses, uh, which were never sustainable and were always going to, um, uh, were always going to, 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 to bust. And the third reason is that you end up with a power uh, deficit. The concentration of income uh, leads to the concentration of uh, market power and essentially what we've had in the United Kingdom and the US, we've had a move back to the 19th century, creating economies that are essentially plutonomies, uh, societies in which um, uh, power is concentrated in, few, in a, a tiny number of hands, particularly in Wall Street and the city, um, and uh, that elite has been able to ensure rules on things like regulation, finance, and tax. Um, that have been very much rigged in their favor in a way that's made the risk of volatility very much uh, higher. Um, now, not only, and this is my, the second question um, I said I wanted to address, which is the extent to which inequality is also a central cause of the failure of recovery. Y the answer to that is yes. One of the key reasons why we are absolutely locked in to this slump uh, is because what has happened to uh, the relationship between consumer demand on the one hand and corporate uh, surpluses uh, on, the, uh, on the other. Um, if, you, if the distribution, if the wage share in the United Kingdom today was the same as it was in 1980, then... Uh, wage earners as a group would have uh, wages that are seven, would be 7% higher. That is roughly £100 billion. Um, that has been stripped out of the economy, not just this year, but you know, last year, the year before, the year before that, and the year before that. Now, that's equivalent to the spending power of um, roughly twice the size of the Manchester conurbation. So you can imagine what effect that has. Now, that wouldn't be necessarily been bad if the money that had been transferred upwards was being used to replace that demand in some way. But, of course, it hasn't. All it's done is boosted and created these corporate, and per corporate surpluses and personal, um, uh, personal fortunes that are effectively now being sat upon. Oh, by the way, in the United States, the this, this shortage of demand is even greater. It's the equivalent of, in the UK, it's 100 billion in the United States. Uh, if, if the 
uh, distribution of wages has been, if the share of wages has been the same today as it was then, then there would be 500 billion pound more in the American economy. Um, and so what we have, these, these, these big corporate surpluses, corporate surpluses are as big as they have ever been in this, in this country. Um, they account for roughly, uh, roughly 5%, which is equivalent of 60 billion. Very little of this is being, being spent. So we have these two factors which are really behind the paralysis uh, that the American, the UK, and the European economies are facing. There's no shortage of money. It's just in the wrong places. Um, now, so what are the lessons? Um, we've basically been operating an economic theory um, uh, that simply doesn't work. It's basically completely flawed. Um, aggregate demand in the UK and most rich, rich economies is wage-led. It's not profit-led. Um, uh, and that means the, uh, a declining wage share uh, leads to lower levels of growth. Um, and that's true not just at an individual country level, it's also true uh, in, in, in aggregate. Um, essentially, allowing small groups uh, to colonize the gains from growth leads to demand deflation, asset appreciation, and a squeeze on the uh, productive economy. Um, also, in contrast to the teachings of uh, the free market school, more equal societies moderate the gyrations of the economic cycle. Um, unequal ones tend to raise the height of the boom, they deepen the extent of the fall, and they extend the length of the trough. Um, so this conference is entitled Cri From Crisis to Opportunity. So um, what can we... Um, is there anything we can do to get out of this trap using distribution, the distribution question, as the root uh, out of it? Um, well, of course, there are some people who say that um, it was the 1950s and the 1960s that there were the real aberration, um, and that the normal, we're now back in a sort of normal position, you know, similar to the 19th century, um, uh, a normal situation in which economies are going to be right, right, uh, run on much li higher levels of inequality. Well, this is, this is, um, this is essentially wrong. Um, the de degree of inequality, the way the cake is distributed, um, is ultimately a question of political choice. Um, uh, none of this means that um, moving to a set of reforms uh, that can reduce the level of inequality are going to be uh, particularly uh, easy. Um, for two reasons, I think. Uh, the first is that, uh, as, we, as we've already discussed, the best evidence is that the level of inequality at the moment is actually, has been rising. It dipped in 2009 um, for various reasons, um, but it's been rising since then. So in the United States in 2010, 93% of growth uh, went to uh, the top 1%. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, real wages have fallen by 7% in the last two years, and uh, the best estimates are that living standards will be static, will have been static between 2007 and 2020. That will be a 13-year period of uh, household income uh, stagnation. Uh, the, in the United Kingdom, the Office for Budget Responsibility uh, which is the independent forecasting body set, set up by the coalition government, uh, is forecasting that the wage share will have fallen by another four percentage points uh, by 2016. Um, uh, the second uh, uh, um, reason why it's not going to be that easy is because um, uh, this argument that inequality leads to instability is by no means, um, it may well be gathering strength, and there are more, are more economists writing about it. Indeed, there was a, a big article in the New York Times just a, a, a few days ago arguing that it, a very similar argument. Um, but although it's being hotly debated, it is not, it's still a debate uh, that yet, has yet to be resolved, and the economic orthodoxy still retains that at a macroeconomic level, there is this trade-off between equality and efficiency. Um, Okay, so 
Um, well, economics, of course, is the gloomy science. Uh, so this all sounds rather gloomy. So uh, I'm going to try and be, end on a slightly more positive note. Um, uh, perhaps the most positive thing to say is, of course, is all the big global institutions, the ILO, the OECD, the IMF, and, and most recently UNCTAD, um, uh, have all um, been writing reports and papers uh, that endorse the things that um, I've just been saying earlier on, uh, which is that inequality is too high, that the wage share in most countries is too low, too low and uh, needs to be reserve, uh, reversed. And a, a recent IMF paper published uh, written by uh, two IMF economists, Andrew Berg and Jonathan Ostry, uh, shows that Okun's, Arthur Okun's trade-off theory um, has failed to stand up to real-world applications. And in fact, uh, more equal, equal economies have had a better record and a more sustained record on growth. Um, and this is particularly significant coming from the IF, IMF, uh, which, as we know, for the last sort of 25 years has been you know, the leading cheerleader for policies uh, such as flexible labor markets and so on, reverse uh, these trends. Um, well, it's only in part a matter of redistribution. Um, I think the evidence probably is that we've reached the limits in most rich countries uh, to the level to which we can redistribute through the tax and uh, benefit system. Um, we need to do much more about taxes. Um, one of the big problems that we've had in, in, in raising levels of welfare spending is that in most countries, the tax systems have moved from being progressive uh, in the 1980s to being uh, regressive. And there's also the problem of tax savings. So there's a lot of work to be done to try and move tax, tax systems uh, to, to make them much more fairer and bear much more heavily on the rich than they do at the moment. Um, but I do think the role of redistribution is probably going to play a relatively moderate role uh, in, in attempting to reverse these trends. The most important area in which we need to concentrate on um, is trying to uh, assure, ensure uh, a more equal distribution before we uh, apply taxes and benefits. And this is what uh, economists call pre-distribution. It's the phrase that was used as I'm sure a lot of you will know by Ed Miliband um, in, a, in a speech uh, a short while ago, um, for which he received a lot of flack in the press for being, you know, reinforcing his image as a, as a policy wonk. But he was absolutely right um, that pre-distribution uh, is the area that countries uh, we need to concentrate on. Now, there isn't time to... Uh, go into what we can do on pre-distribution. Um, so I just want to re uh, mention four things which I think are the ingredients of, of, of what needs to be done. The first is we need a new social contract with labor. The present social contract has completely broken down. The world, or large parts of the world, are simply denying significant sections of uh, their working populations a decent livelihood. Um, now, there are three things that we need that need to be elements of this new social contract. The first is um, uh, we need to reinstate, reinstate the goal of full employment. Easier said than done, of course, um, but austerity is clearly not the route to do it. Um, uh, and all the evidence is very clear that um, full employment is associated with buoyant wages and higher wage shares. Um, the second thing we need to do is rebalance uh, the bargaining power uh, that's been shifted to capital, away from capital uh, to labor. Uh, the evidence is absolutely unambiguous uh, by economists uh, that nations with widespread collective bargaining uh, have higher wage shares, narrower dispersions of earnings, and successful economies as well. Um, uh, the erosion of <coughs> trade unions, um, which is what's happened in, in, in most countries, is also not in, in, inevitable. Let me just give you one example. Tesco's in the United Kingdom, uh, which is a much maligned company for various reasons, um, 
but it has a trade union membership of 46%. That is three times the average uh, trade union membership in the private sector in the United Kingdom. Uh, the third thing we need to do as part of this social contract, we need to do something about uh, low pay. Uh, and there's absolutely no reason why, we can't, why big companies cannot increase uh, their, their pay at the bottom level. Uh, indeed, the, the evidence from the United States in particular is that the majority of the low paid work in big corporations that are highly profitable. Indeed, 50, the 50 top low paid employers enjoyed, 60% of them enjoyed increasing profits over the last year. Um, so something can be done on low, low paid. The second thing we need as part of this process of redistribution is a set of much tougher social norms. I think it's sometimes forgotten that um, what I've called elsewhere the shame gene um, was this sort of hidden hand that operated in the 1950s and 60s, um, which had a very, very effective device for keeping the lid on executive pay at the top. Uh, and we need some similar sort of gene or some similar sort of social norm back, which ends this extraordinary sense of entitlement that uh, operates within the city and within boardrooms. And the third element we need on pre-distribution um, is to move away from the dominant model of, uh, the, the do dominant business model of shareholder value which has operated over the last 30 years. It's that model which has done so much to drive the process of industrial and business restructuring, mega mergers, downsizing, private equity deals. And a lot, it's a, a lot of the reason why we've had this transfer from the bottom to the top has been through these kind of activities which, led, which has led not to more productive economies but the transfer of existing wealth away from the bulk of people to this very small elite. And unless we change that model, then uh, we will continue to have this process of transfer of wealth and a very limited process of the creation of new wealth. And the fourth thing we need um, uh, is a, a recognition that the state needs to take a very much bigger, uh, play, play a very much bigger and central role in uh, strategic macroeconomic thinking when it comes to distribu the distribution question. I think one of the interesting things about the last sort of 20 years, uh, uh, again, I'm sorry, a, a lot of these examples come from the United Kingdom and the United States, um, but essentially the question of factor shares or the distribution of the cake has simply not been an issue at all within the policy and civil service making machinery uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the, it's played a completely marginal role. Uh, the question of factor shares and the impact that factor shares on the way the economy works is not represented in any economic models in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, and it's been effectively the elephant in the room, the invisible bit that everybody's ignored. It's fallen through the gaps between uh, departments. And it needs to be put, something big needs to change there if we are to start recognizing that inequality is important and something needs to be done about it. Um, I, I, I've actually written a paper about how we can do this, and there are copies, I think there are a few copies outside about how uh, such a machinery uh, might work. Um, now, uh, none of this, of what I've been saying, is particularly utopian. Um, indeed, there are examples of reforms in each of these areas taking place, and I haven't got time to go into them, in countries um, uh, across the world, from France uh, to Switzerland. Um, and I think the reality is, the danger is, that unless we uh, go down these roads of the sort of changes um, that I and others th th have been outlining, then we are likely to be locked into a very prolonged era of high in inequality and the turbulence that goes uh, with it. I just want to end uh, with a final word that comes from uh, Albert Edwards. Um, not sure if you've heard who this person is. He, he, he works for the uh, Big Investment Bank Society General. 
um, and he's probably one of Europe's leading uh, financial strategists. Uh, and he's so he's he's such a he's so well known for his bearish views uh, that he's known within the financial industry as Ice Age. Um, anyway, just to end with his prediction, which he wrote very recently in in one of his one of his regular papers to clients. Capital may not have it quite so easy in the next phase of capitalism. Going forward, labor will fight back to take its proper share of the national cake. We will see. Thank you.